it's a uh, it's a personal pleasure for me to introduce the moderator of the panel, a former uh, professor teacher of mine, Mark Landy, is a professor of political science at Boston College. Uh, I'll mention two books that he has uh, co-authored with his friend and colleague Sid Milkus from the University of Virginia. Uh, one is an American government textbook, uh, American Government Enduring Principles, uh, Critical Choices, although I think the other version of the, the subtitle is about the balance of liberty and democracy. Um, and then a book that I have used in the classroom, Milkus and Landy, on presidential greatness. Uh, and the theme of it is to study five great presidents and make the argument for what greatness is. Um, so this would not be accepted by most social scientists today. It's an N of five. There isn't a large data uh, set there, but Washington, Jefferson, Jackson, Lincoln, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, he's uh, a, a student of public policy and of uh, American political thought, uh, sort of a modern day Aristotelian in a sense. So he will introduce the panel and take us on our discussion. Thank you. Great, Jim. It, it, is, it is a particular thrill to be here and, and uh, see my former student make good. It's <laughs> wonderful. So books have dedications. Why not panels? I dedicate this panel to the man who Jim Caesar taught me was the inventor of the American political party system, that unsung hero, Martin Van Buren. <laughs> so thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin, for conceiving of a vital underpinning of our constitutional order. And I know that there were going to be some questions raised about whether that underpinning still underpins. Um, parties of the staff of our political life. Sorry, T.R., Ross Perot, Howard Schultz, Every president since 1853 has either been a Democrat or a Republican. The House of, every House of Congress since 1849 has been controlled by either the Republicans or the Democrats. Therefore, it's not surprising that in the discussion of polarization that we've been having, parties have pro played such a prominent role. Jonathan Rauch defends Tammany Hall for its role in the civic education and assimilation of immigrants. And by the way, if you should watch Martin Scorsese's amazing epic movie, Gangs of New York, and you see Boss Tweed coming to the boat, greeting the immigrants as they come off the, come off the gangplank, this Protestant orangeman giving a helping hand to Irish Catholics from the South, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's an amazing scene and I think very much makes uh, Jonathan's point. Harvey Mansfield thumbs his nose at the framers in his defense of party as integral to the way our governing system must operate. Um, I think Harvey might agree that Aristotle would love Martin Van Buren. On the other hand, not everything's so positive in our discussion so far. Um, Norm Orenstein points the finger at our, the Republican Party leader, first minority, then majority leader, Newt Gingrich, for being such a uh, instigator of our current uh, polarization. So parties are in the air. And in that, in that vein, I, I have some questions that I hope the panel will uh, will take up at some point. Um, are they the heart of the problem or a possible means of amelioration? Are the parties of today essentially different from earlier parties? And if so, how and why has that change taken place? If indeed parties are valuable, to quote the title of E.J. Dionne's fine book, why do Americans hate parties? And by the way, I think we have the most excellent group of panelists to take up uh, the, these topics. Um, they're all three extremely illustrious, and you have the capsule bios in your programs, and so I'm not going to take up more time by repeating those. I just want to say a word about each, each of these fine 
folks and uh, something that I think they particularly bring to the table. Early in his career, Jim Caesar wrote the seminal book about presidential selection, and he's been a keen student of party politics and elections ever since. Mo Fiorina, at the end, has been the most powerful scholarly voice claiming that the extent of polarization among ordinary people is overrated. And he's written this really seminal book, The Myth of the Culture War, I'm sorry, Culture War, The Myth of a Polarized America. So he's kind of a little bit against the grain uh, <laughs> of what we've been seeing. Ron Christie leavens us academics by actually knowing something about what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis in our, our nation's capital. He's written about it. He advises people about it. He's in the thick of the Washington scene. He served in a, in a presidential administration, so I think it's a great mix. And with no further ado, I think we'll start with Professor Fiorina. Thank you, Mark, and thank you all for coming out on the Saturday morning. I ran into this um, cartoon just a little while ago, and I thought it was very appropriate for the, uh, the event today. Uh, we are the people on the top, presumably. So. The uh, political science profession has traditionally uh, had a good view, a positive view of parties. Uh, this is one of those quotations that every undergraduate political science major runs into at various times in their uh, studies. This is from E. E. Schatzschneider's classic book, uh, Party Government in 1942. Democracy is unthinkable, save in terms of parties. And you still see echoes of this. For example, this is Justice Scalia's uh, majority opinion in the unfortunate case where they set aside the California blanket primary, where he is sort of, you read the opinion, you can see that they're, they're citing uh, some, I think, outmoded uh, ideas from American political parties literature of the mid-century. The traditional view, and this is actually from one of my lectures, PS1 lectures, uh, 35 years ago, is that uh, the parties did good stuff, basically. That's why we, we like them. Uh, they organized and operated the government. What if there were no parties? You just had 435 members of the House and 100 senators. Uh, just imagine the chaos. Uh, they focused responsibility. Again, if there were no parties, there would be no collective responsibility. You couldn't say who's responsible or who should get credit. They articulate issues and educate the public. And it's not enough just to articulate issues, you have to aggregate them. You just can't have a whole welter of issues thrown against the political system. You have to some, somehow combine them. And they simplify the electoral system for the voters. Voters can't just decide person after person. The party label gives them a lot of information. Now, a lot of us today, I think, uh, have a different view. Certainly, my view has changed over time. I think today's parties do uh, a lot of bad stuff. Um, they hinder the operation of government in many cases. We just had a shutdown because of partisanship. They confuse responsibility. The earlier literature was written during a time when unified government was the norm. One party controlled everything. Uh, in the modern era, divided government has been more common. The parties play, play games, blame shifting. Uh, uh, they can, so they confuse responsibility. They muddy the issues today. They try to, uh, try to muddy the positions on the issues. They divide society. They try to wedge uh, one group away from another. And they oversimplify the electoral system that if I want to vote for lower taxes, I have to vote against abortion, for example, and vice versa, that everything is pushed into a binary uh, choice. Why has this occurred? Uh, well, I argue in a series of essays and books that there's been, over time, a change in the incentives to participate. When you combine that with participatory reforms that made participation easier, it led to unrepresentative participants more than ever running our politics today. And then you add that to that party sorting, which adds as a, it acts as a catalyst to make everything uh, more serious, I think. And I'll explain, it's all very abstract, I'll explain that. Over time, there has been a decline in material incentives. Uh, James Q. Wilson uh, once said, there are three incentives, three forms of incentives for people to get involved in politics. The first is material, to get stuff. The second is solidary, you wanna be part of your team, you wanna be part of a social group. And the third is purposive, you actually wanna accomplish something like saving the whales, preserving abortion, et cetera. Well, over time, more than a century now, there's been a decline in material incentives. Uh, civil service starts in the 1880s, public sector unionization uh, in 1960 and afterwards. This really needs more work, uh, the idea of public sector unionization and the implications for American politics. 
uh, conflict of interest laws. Uh, Ted, Ted Lowy, a famous old political scientist, once said that uh, conflict of interest used to be why you went into politics, and now we've made it, now we've made it a crime. Um, universalistic policies and entitlements, again, the parties are not giving out particularistic benefits. Uh, these things come to you as a matter of right. Uh, even if we could reverse any of these things, we wouldn't. The political culture has changed and today's population wouldn't, wouldn't go back to the spoil system or any of the other old line party material uh, incentives. And the media contributes to this too. Larry Sabato talks about how the media went from being lap dogs to watchdogs to now being junkyard dogs. They're just mean. The only way you convince the media that you're acting honestly is to vote against your material interest. One of my favorite anecdotes uh, to just illustrate former parties and today's parties it's from a book uh, by Milton Rakoff, who is the father of the noted historian Jack Rakoff. And it's uh, the title, of the book is on the Chicago machine, and the title is We Don't Want Nobody, Nobody Sent. And the anecdote goes like this. It's from Ag Abner Mikva, who was a longtime congressman and district court judge, a, a good public service who just died a few years ago. And in 1948, he's at Chicago Law School, and he, um, Adlai Stevenson and, uh, is on running for governor and Paul Douglas for uh, senator. And uh, today's students won't know, these are liberal lions. And, and uh, Mikva wants to work. And so he goes down to the local Democratic headquarters, walks in, introduces himself to the alderman and says he wants to work in the campaign. And the, the alderman says, who sent you? And Mikva says, nobody sent me. And the alderman says, we don't want nobody, nobody sent. <laughs> this is the parties acting as gatekeepers that nowadays you go on the internet, you sign up, and they sign up all your Facebook friends as well. In those days, they, they want to keep, keep a lid on just who gets to participate. Well, Mikva's not easily dissuaded, so he argues with the guy, and the guy says, we don't got no jobs. And Mikva says, I don't want a job. And the guy says, we don't want nobody, don't want a job. <laughs> yeah. So there again, there's, there's the method of control, you know, uh, people come in. And Mikva continues to argue, and uh, the guy finally says, where are you from, kid? And Mikva says, I'm from the University of Chicago. The guy says, we don't want nobody from the University of Chicago. <laughs> and that's the difference between today's politics. Th these people, they wanted people who, who were materially oriented so they could control them. And once these incentives went away, then people began to participate for other reasons, often purposive. People wanted to accomplish something. And so the, the party elites became less materially oriented and more programmatic, more ideological. It brought a different kind of person into the party. That happened at the same time, or it was, it was accumulating at the same time as Politics became more participatory. Everybody here, we took, we took uh, presidential nominations out of the back room, out of the smoke-filled rooms, and gave them to the grassroots, and an era of candidate-centered politics ensued. Meetings of all sorts of uh, legislatures, boards, et cetera, were to be open. Votes were to be recorded. In the courts, rules of standing were relaxed. People could get in and sue on behalf of trees and salmon, et cetera, and how they couldn't do that before. Uh, in the bureaucracy, Again, bureaucratic procedures were opened, uh, partic uh, participation, you could uh, send in comments and so forth. We even subsidized interveners in places. At the local level was maximum feasible participation, try to get people involved. All kinds of local bodies proliferated. Uh, par propositions became more used, and of course, just one new technology after another. Now, all of this was got, uh, done under the guise of power to the people. And I think most of us at the time uh, certainly thought these were all good things were occurring. But I think what we didn't realize was that when the doors of government were opened, it wasn't the ordinary American citizen that walked in. It was a different kind of person, a person, again, an issue activist, a party, an issue activist, an ideological sort of person. And uh, I just want to contrast these people, whom I call the political class in my writings, with the general public, who I call normal people. And uh, the general public, uh, people are for the most part inattentive. They are confused about programs. They are ambivalent. They are pro-choice and pro-life at the same time. And those are not criticisms in any way. That's why we have representative government uh, in a nutshell. Ordinary people are concerned with bread and butter issues rather than a lot of the niche issues that dominate politics today. And they're uninvolved politically. They simply, uh, again, Megan McArdle, these are your people, ordinary people. Here's some just da data I think are useful for people who live, eat, and breathe politics. Uh, nearly everyone here is a member of the 1%, and unfortunately that doesn't refer to our incomes. Uh, it's the 1% of the population, of the electorate, that has a subscription, digital or print, to the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. 1% of the public has a subscription like that. About 1% of the public tunes in to Fox News each night, or Rachel Maddow each night. Uh, it's been commented recently that 
Um, CNN has almost as many panelists as they have viewers uh, nowadays. Uh, they're, uh, they're less than half a percent here now. In contrast, uh, when it comes to the Summer Olympics, um, six times as many people watch Sunday night football as read the New York Times on Sunday morning. Uh, Big Bang Theory is finally going off. And the internet hasn't really changed everything. Uh, there's a Facebook study two years ago that uh, tracked people's search behavior over a 90-day period. And they found, and there are millions of people here, and they got permission. This was one of the ones that had permission. They found that only 14% of the people they tracked read 10 or more news articles in 90 days. That's less than one per week. And they found that 96% of the people they tracked had read zero or one opinion column in that whole 90-day period. So Paul Krugman, uh, George Will, et cetera, uh, you have a very small audience out there. Pew Research Center just last year r reported that less than 4% of uh, adults say Twitter is an important source of news. That's one of the most positive things I've heard in a, a long time. Katy Perry has about twice as many followers as Donald Trump. Uh, and all Twitter accounts are apparently, um, the follower figures are apparently about 50% off, at least in terms of bots and zombies and so forth. Uh, I want to digress for a moment to talk about the tribalism thing, which came up several times t uh, yesterday. I didn't want to get in the question line. I wanted to save it for today. Um, the, um, this, there is something there, of course, the notion that Americans are dividing into two tribes. But both the breadth and the depth, I think, are seriously exaggerated. Uh, here's the first thing to consider, that when the national election studies began to be done in the um, 1950s, 75% of the American public said, I'm a Democrat or a Republican. In the last several elections, it's 60%. So 40% of the public won't even cop to being a member of one of these two tribes. And in fact, there's a very good book by Samara Klar and Anna Krupnikov on this new development. And they simply say there's a lot of people who, for whom the whole idea of partisanship, partisanship today is unattractive. It's a, it's a good book. I recommend it. A second thing is that um, the, the way we measure these things, we use a, a, a measure called the thermometer score. People are asked to rate a person, a group, a party, et cetera. And it is clearly true that ratings of the opposite party have gone down over time. Actually, ratings of your own party have also gone down more recently. But so it's, tr it's true that people, Democrats rate the Republicans more coldly than they used to. Republicans rate the Democrats more coldly. That's a fact. That that fact indicates hate or loathing is an interpretation. Those are words you often hear. I'm sure my wife rates me 20 degrees on some days. But I don't think that uh, I don't think she loathes me or hates me. That that I don't think we should make too much of some of this. And in particular, the marriage study has come up, and this has gotten a lot of publicity. That my colleague Shanto Ayengar pointed out that people now say they're more people say they're unhappy about their child marrying across parties than across races or across religion. And as you can imagine, many of you are journalists. The journalists just jumped all over this. Well, there's a bright young political scientist at Tufts University who was a little skeptical. And he did a survey of the five New England states plus New York and Pennsylvania, and I'll explain in a moment why the unusual sample. And he asked the people in the sample, would you be upset if your child married a Democrat or Republican? And um, his figures are 19% of Democrats said their, uh, Republicans said their child, they'd be upset if their child married a Democrat. Tw uh, nearly one in three Democrats said their child would be upset if their child married a Republican. Uh, the other two figures on the right are Chantal Yangar's figures. So they're sort of in the same ballpark. The New England types are a little more hostile to Republicans than the, the national sample that Yangar used. But um, Hirsch went on. This is uh, Itan Hirsch. He asked people, are you a baseball fan? And 60% of the people in the sample said, yes, I'm a baseball fan. That happens to be the same number of people who say, yes, I'm a Democrat or Republican. And then he asked them this, would you be upset if you're a Red Sox fan, if your child married a Yankee fan. Uh, you have said if you're Phillies, your child married a, and as you can see, the numbers are in the same ballpark. And the conclusion is they're playing with us. That, that uh, you know, and, and this is actually, um, uh, for those of us who have spent our lives wallowing in survey data, it's becoming increasingly a matter of concern that we're not sure we can trust the data anymore. You've, you've seen figures like a majority of Republicans think weapons of mass destruction were found in Iraq. And a majority of Democrats say inflation went up in the Reagan administration. You know, and that, that's really disturbing to hear that. To hear that. Well, it turns out if you pay people 50 cents for each right answer, you wipe out about half of that. That, that, uh, that a lot of people know damn well if there weren't weapons of mass destructions or that inflation went down. But they're just, here's a cheap talk. You know, here's a chance to stick it to the other party in a survey. It costs them nothing. 
you know. And so, I mean, the, the, the survey instrument, I think, is under a lot of pressure today. But so anyway, all I'm, I'm saying is there, I think there is some of this tribalism out there, but uh, it's, it's, don't, don't run away with it. It's, uh, it's exaggerated. All right, back to party sorting. As I've argued a, a lot, it's not that the public has polarized. The, the opinion distributions look about the same as they did 40 years ago. It's that the parties have sorted. Traditionally, the parties were big tents, not only, and not just in the post-war period, although I, I think that's an important point that was made today, but even in the 1880s when Ward Bryce is writing about American parties, he's writing about how they're basically patronage parties. They don't have any real principles. And Duverger talks about this being a feature internationally. Uh, in two-party systems, the parties tend to be big tents. They're very heterogeneous. So when these unrepresentative participants came in that I talked about a few minutes ago, instead of going into both the Democrat and Republican parties, we wouldn't have had the kind of party polarization we have, but they didn't. The parties sorted. And by that, I mean that th when I was growing up, the Democrats were a left of center party with a conservative wing. The Republicans were a right of center party with a liberal wing. No more. Through processes of both replacement and um, um, joining, um, um, the parties are... Parties are not Democrats or left wing, the Republicans are right wing. The middle is still there, it just doesn't have a home in either party. Now, you can see here's another way to look at it. That top line is the easiest one. The correlation between party identification and ideological identification used to be a pretty moderate 0.4 in 1972. It's now 0.7. So liberals are Democrats, conservatives are Republicans. And the individual issues show the same trends. It's important to understand that this process is stronger the higher up in the political hierarchy you go. So the political class is very well sorted. And what this diagram shows is the difference between Democrats and Republicans in three categories over time on whether abortion should always be a matter of a woman's choice. The top line shows that Democratic and Republican donors and workers, which is about 10 to 15 percent of the electorate, are they have sorted very hot, heavily over time and they're now about, it's, it's sort of like 80-20 their distributions. Strong partisans who are about 20% oh, of the electorate, they're again highly sorted. You get down to that bottom line, weak partisans, not nearly as much sorted. And of course, then there's a lot of independents out there too. So the political class is highly ideological, very well sorted. These are the parties, the larger electorate, much less so. Why did it happen? Uh, we don't have as good a handle on that uh, as I'd like to. Race, you can tell a good story. Uh, African Americans move from the South to the North. That pushes the Northern Democrats in a more liberal direction. And that creates additional tensions with the Southern Democrats. Meanwhile, the Sun Belt is growing. The Republicans see the opportunity to move right on race. So, so that's a coherent story. But why did the party of industrial workers uh, become the party, the Green Party? And why did the party of Baptists and Catholics become the party of, of choice rather than party of life. That uh, some, some of these things are involve complex electoral coalitions that we don't have a good a handle on, I think, but that's another book. I don't have any problem with, pol with principled parties per se. The problem in the United States is we only have two of them. If you go around the world, the European parties have often been, been highly polarized. They're, or put it this way, not polarized so much as programmatic. They've had clear, principles, clear platforms, and you can see this list of things here. We don't need to go to the extent of France and have 17 parties in parliament, but you know they, they have multiple options. In the United States, we only have two, as I indicated earlier. So there's a whole lot of things, no matter how I vote, that I have to vote against something I'm for because I only have the two choices. So I would be happy with, with if we, we uh, well, that's, that's my final slide, actually. Um, Today's parties do not look or act like the parties of mid 20th century. The party system is old. I think that point was made also yesterday. It has its roots in the 1960s. It's out of date. It doesn't fit today's population. It doesn't fit today's issues. On balance, I now think they do more harm than good. And so I know that various people like my friend Norm, who I think has already left, disagree with me. But my attitude is, unlike last night where the, the call was for renewal rather than destruction, I think we need destruction before we get renewal. So Ron Howard, and Mike and Oprah, and Jesse Ventura, and Tom Kirkman for that matter, run. Let's tear the whole thing down and start over again. Okay. Okay. All right. So I didn't know that Fiorina was under the pay of Howard Schultz. This is, uh, this is a very disturbing <laughs> discovery. Uh, Professor Caesar. Thank you. Um, it's, a great, it's a great pleasure. Well, no, let me start over again. It's an enormous relief to be here in Phoenix. A reef because maybe, just maybe, out here in the desert amidst the cacti, 
it's possible to be detached from the constant and unending political feuding and ceaseless partisan battles that define our nation's uh, capital. I have a feeling that it's unbearable. And I can't escape the urge, like um, those in that movie Network, to throw open a window in the middle of the night and shout at the top of my lungs, I can't take it anymore. Coming out here so far from Washington, even for a conference focused on polarization, is a, a chance to forget the proverbial do, uh, dossier, the charges of FBI conspiracy, and all the claims and counterclaims about some fellow named uh, Papadopoulos. <laughs> uh, I'm coming instead, um, incidentally, from, from Charlottesville, which was made the center of the world, in part due to a comment a couple years ago made by the president. Charlottesville is at the outer edge of the zone dominated by Washington. Of course, uh, like everyone here, I could, if I only had the willpower, I could turn off CNN's Chris Cuomo, shut down Fox's uh, Sean Hannity. Indeed, I, I could choose to ignore the incessant Twitter rants on this misnamed thing called the, the social media, because in, in a way you could ask what's so social about it. When I, when I think of that term social, what comes to mind to me are events like a, an ice cream social or a pancake breakfast social where people meet and greet and exchange pleasantries about the weather or the local football team. So somehow this name is attached inappropriately to the term. So it would be possible to go cold turkey. But one thing I can't do when I want local information in Charlottesville is avoid the, the local newspaper delivered to my door every morning, which is the Washington Post. And then the inevitable syndrome of despair inevitably starts all over again. Every section in the newspaper is preoccupied with the ongoing struggle, carrying out a war against the president. It's on the front page, it's on the cultural and style pages, it's on the sports page, and it's even in the obituaries with its sad stories of those who have deceased from pain and suffering brought on by their despair and hatred of Donald Trump. <laughs> What's the immediate source of this strange situation of polarization? It's the deep opposition, bordering on outright hatred, no doubt, richly deserved of this man who occupies the presidency. Beginning from his startling and unseemly campaign for the office, the utter shock of his victory, confounding the likes of even the indomitable Nate Silver and forcing him away from politics to the world of sports, Trump's disruptive approach to the office, in brief, his unwillingness to assume anything like the mantle of the presidency, all of his de uh, Democratic opponents, along with the fringe of former Republicans, most with newly acquired employment as columnists for the Washington Post or the New York Times, all of these have turned against Trump and refused to accept the, the fact of his presidency. For the first couple of years of the presidency, I think it's fair to speak in many instances of fake polarization. Fake in the sense that the Democrats took issue with the president, not because they were opposed to the crux of his policies, but because it was Donald Trump who was advocating them. This kind of polarization could fade the minute he leads office. I mean, for example, Trump's wish to be more friendly with Russia or his plan to end foreign military involvements. Um, all of these things uh, would be example. If by strange chance Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio had been uh, elected to the presidency in, 19, in 2006 and they had followed the policies of good Republicans, the ones good Republicans were supposed to follow, Democrats would surely be where they're supposed to be on the other side of many of these issues. They'd be asking why we are not taking care of Russia, as uh, Obama promised to do right before the 2012 election, or they'd be demanding that Jeb Bush immediately withdraw troops from Afghanistan and put an end to this conflict, rather than citing approval of uh, the views of such people as military commanders, whom Democrats are loath to uh, to speak of. So all of this is uh, fake or evanescent based on opposition to a person without deep or solid roots. Even the hasty move of so many Democrats since the election to adopt 
the fantasy propositions of the Green New Deal devised to, by a think tank of a 29-year-old Democratic representative is partly fake as well, embraced uh, for the most part to counter the president. There are, however, briefly uh, deeper issues that reflect maybe real polarization between the parties. These flow from different ways of life for people from different segments of our population. One vector involves age. If you're younger, a millennial, or a member of the Z generation, and especially if you've had the misfortune of attending a mainline university, you're apt to be more, uh, more and far more secular and uh, more woke in your cultural views, while the older, who have the audacity to keep on living, remain more traditional. And then there's the vector of where you live. If you're living in a coastal zone, the place is said to be more productive, though also featuring the greatest degree of squalor and inequality, you're moving more democratic. Whereas if you live more in the middle of the country, in smaller towns and rural areas, you might be trending more in a Republican direction. These vectors and their others point to stark differences that are likely to grow up and have grown up separating people and politics on many matters. Though whether these are greater than differences that we've seen previously, or just sorted more rationally between the parties, as Mo just pointed out, that's another question. There are two basic ways of thinking about the political world. One of them is to see things entirely from a partisan perspective. You object in uh, your object in politics is to pursue and promote the programs and ideas that you are convinced are right or just. And you pursue these things to the maximum availing yourself of every legal method, and then some to try to achieve your objective. If the end, let's say, is social justice or saving the planet, nothing could, should or could stand in the way of this partisan goal. The other way of looking at the political world is to take a step back from your own partisan views and ask another question. The objective here is to try to discover how things should be arranged in the country so the country can best survive and have people get along to some degree with each other in a functioning Republican political system. This is the aim, and uh, if some parts of the partisan goal would need to be sacrificed to the process, so be it. The common good is what is sought. Normally, when pursuing this uh, second objective, the means are, are not to ask people in their own uh, good spirit to pursue the common good, nor to expect that they would do so of their own account. Most people, most of the time, don't act this way, or they confuse matters and see the common good through the lens of their own partisan views. The usual way in which this objective is achieved is through institutional arrangements of some kind that are so much accepted that the partisans do not think they can challenge them or change them. The partisans play within these rules because they don't think that they can alter them. At the top of the institutional list um, we face in the nation today is this institutional area of recruitment and presentation of candidates for the presidency. It drives much of the political activity in the country, and it becomes itself a chief contributing cause of polarization. Just uh, look at what is happening today in the open party, the Democrats. Some two years before the election, we're already in full election mode electioneering by the current method of outlandish and often demagogic appeal will now be with us for some time. The press and mo uh, media will focus almost exclusively on this full time. The conduct of much of the Senate is directly affected by this race, as senator after senator becomes a candidate. Instead of being uh, the body that slows things down and introduces moderation, the exact opposite is the case. The American founders thought they developed the system to control and channel the ambitions of candidates for the presidency. It was called the Electoral College, which was meant to be the nominating system and, or sifting system, as much as it is, as we know it today, affecting the final election system. It was a fine, fine try by the founders. They were certainly aware of the importance of this problem, but it never worked. By the wit and part of uh, Martin Van Buren, we developed another institution to take over this uh, system, at least partially. And it controlled somewhat the ambitions of those who sought the office of presidency. 
it was the political party. The political party now, going back to Woodrow Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt, began the destruction of this system of nominations. Its institutional demise was largely achieved uh, after 1972. The full practical consequences became apparent in 2016. There is today no effectual institutional control of this nominating system. Or stated otherwise, the whole part of our political system, this whole part, has become deinstitutionalized. This became obvious to Republicans in 2016. They had, meaning the elite, had a candidate that no one in the higher ranks of the party wanted, a person whom none in the higher ranks of the party even considered a real Republican. And yet he showed up and took the mantle of the party, thank you. This is how the system or non-system now works in this arena. The Democrats faced a, a similar trial in, uh, are facing a similar trial for 2020. Following the 2016 election, a number of people who think in institutional terms got together in Washington to try to figure out what to do about this problem. The strongest suggestion was to try to somehow return control of this process to political parties. I think it's fair to say that this didn't happen, and I believe it's almost certain to say that it is not going to happen. It's only nostalgia to think of what parties in this area once were. There is no institutional mechanism today that is capable of commanding the respect to force potential candidates to adjust how they pursue their, uh, the path to the presidency. The parties can't do it, and it seems plausible to me, why not, that some in the future may follow the mechanism of avoiding parties altogether and running as an independent outside of the party process, such as it is. Barring a catastrophe in this nation of some, ki some kind, I don't think it can go back against the claims of ever greater democracy. So, does this mean we will continually elect in the future candidates of the peculiar ability and talents and defects of President Trump? Of course not. A deinstitutionalized system will be just that, open to the boring, no less than the demagogic, with the outcome determined in each election year by the shifting moods of the people. This is the new, the new world that we will have to learn to uh, uh, navigate. Ron. Good morning, everybody. All right. So if I had to fly all the way out here from Washington, D.C., and think that I was going to get a little bit more Arizona sun and a little bit more warmth, let me try that again. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank Paul and I want to thank his staff and his team for really putting together an amazing conference, an amazing gathering uh, where I think for the last couple of days we've really heard much about polarization, some of the problems that we face, as well as hopefully some of the solutions to get us out of the morass that we seem to find ourselves in today. So I come here today as a recovering lawyer and a recovering lobbyist. And so, as a recovering lawyer and a recovering lobbyist, what is one equipped to do? Teach a course, naturally, called the Washington Ecosystem, right? I spent eight years on Capitol Hill. I spent four years in the White House. I was a lobbyist. So therefore, I figure I might as well try to find a way to monetize this and have fun doing it as well. So I teach a course at Georgetown called the Washington Ecosystem. And for being an English major and being a lawyer, of course, I spent most of my time as far away from the science buildings as possible. But I look at the, the denizens of this ecosystem, right? In a fully functioning ecosystem, you have symbiotic relationships between the different organisms, the different entities in there, that if they're all working together and they're all working towards a common purpose, then maybe this thing works. But then you look at the 45th president of the United States. Does he believe that we have a functioning ecosystem. No, he says we have a swamp, we've got to drain the swamp, let's get rid of the swamp. So in my discussion today, what I'm gonna to try to do is in about 10 to 14 minutes, I'm gonna to distill to you what I give my students at Georgetown University in about 14 weeks. 
and we're going to look at this Washington ecosystem and say, who are these denizens? Who are these participants? Is it fully functioning? And of course, with a nod to the moderator, uh, is it really on topic of parties, polarization, what I'm actually up here to talk about? So let's start at one end of Pennsylvania Avenue, the first end, the Congress. Who are the denizens of this Congress? Are they fully functioning members of this ecosystem? And what are they supposed to do? And I teach my students, you need to do two things. You need to look at one of how these folks get elected, one, and number two, what do they do once they arrive? Right? So it's the being there at home versus being here in the United States Capitol. And how do they act differently? What sort of things do they do in Washington that they might not ever do back in their congressional districts or their states? So number one, you look at someone like Paul Ryan, who's recently retired. He represented the Wisconsin 1st Congressional District. Did he ever identify as a Republican in Wisconsin in a district that Hillary Clinton carried overwhelmingly, that Barack Obama carried overwhelmingly? No, he was Paul from around the corner, around the block. And by the way, most of my cousins and my family live here. I'm one of you, we're all in this together. Versus Ryan coming to Washington, becoming the leader, of course, of the Budget Committee of Ways and Means, and ultimately Speaker of the House, the ultimate partisan insider once he's in Washington, D.C. What do these folks do once they do get to Washington, D.C.? I find it fascinating. We talk about the breakdown in party structure, but heaven forbid that you as a Democrat try to buck Nancy Pelosi and Pelosi's vision of what the Democrats should be doing in Congress. Heaven forbid if you do not go hook, line, and sinker with what Kevin McCarthy is trying to do and lead the Republicans out of the political wilderness and to try to find a way back to the majority. So how do they do this? By and large, a lot of this, it's money. It's fundraising. It's finding a way to keep a leash on what these politicians are doing. And so when I was sitting in the back this morning, my iPhone was buzzing, as it always does, and I wanted to direct you to a couple of emails that I got this morning because I think it's indicative of what we're dealing with. So at 8.07, I got an election alert from the National Republican Senatorial Committee, right? Election alert, breaking news. Bernie Sanders raises 5.9 million online in first 24 hours. Ron, Bernie Sanders' first fundraising hall is the biggest of all Democrats. So you sit there and you're like, okay, that's nice. And then, not to be outdone, dim redistricting. And then, of course, Trump's census rigging scheme is heading to the Supreme Court. So in the span of 8.05 to 8.47, both the Democrats and the Republicans, as I sit here in Arizona, are sending me emails telling me that one's more evil than the other, and by the way, send a check. So you move from that, and I look at my students, and I say, okay, well, how is Congress supposed to work orthodox versus how it's actually working unorthodox? Let's take the budget, for example, right? Congressional Budget Act of 1974 says that no earlier than the first, January, first Monday in January, no later than the first Monday in February, the president is supposed to develop a budget and submit it to Congress for its review. What happened this year? Nothing. Are there ramifications for that? No. Why did they not deliver a budget? Because we're heading into an election year. Why put the numbers on the table when the other side can criticize you? Okay, well, by April 15th, of course, the Congress, the House and the Senate, are supposed to have a budget resolution outlining how the federal government is supposed to spend our tax dollars. When was the last time, when was the last time that Congress actually passed a budget resolution, had all of the 12 subcommittees of the Appropriations Committee mark up and have their bills on the floor I pose that to you. Was it last year? Was it five years ago? It was 1998. So what has actually happened is that the unorthodox has become the orthodox. The way that the rules are supposed to go has now hewed largely to being strong with party identification and saying that the other guys broke it and we're gonna fix it, but yet and still not putting their own marbles on the table for fear of being attacked. So let's take a little journey further down Pennsylvania Avenue in this Washington ecosystem, and let's travel to what I call K Street, right? K Street, Gucci Gulch, lobbyists, special interest groups. Also, 
academia, right? If you can find a Bill Galston from Brookings to write a nice paper that adheres to your ideology or your political perspective, you can say, well, aha, as a moderate, even Brookings and Bill Galston think that my idea is the right one, and here's the evidence that he cited. Let's take a look at that. Or you could say Norm Ornstein. I think Norm has already gone back to the Washington Swamp. But look at Norm Ornstein, and you just go after all these different uh, academicians, all these different intellectuals, and they use that in a partisan fashion to further their agenda. But who else do you have in this K Street corridor other than the lobbyists themselves, right? And you hear so much about special interests. Well, my special interest might be the folks wearing the jersey that I like, and those other guys are the evil swamp dwellers, whereas the other team might say, well, we're the righteous ones, we're the good ones, and it's the other ones that are on the wrong side of the fence, the wrong side of the issues. And of course, what do they do this entire time? They raise money off of it. And where's the forum that they often get the opportunity to vent these views, to have these discussions, to really try to advance their party's platform and position other than the media, right? So the media has changed so much in the last 20 years, and on one hand, I'm, I'm very happy to be a part of it. I am the uh, North American political analyst for the BBC, and I can certainly tell you that there is an insatiable hunger, an insatiable, really, desire to try to figure out what in the heck is going on in the United States in the era of Donald Trump. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But I also look at that in the context of how much harm that is doing to our society, right? I won't name networks since I'm under contract for one and won't, don't want to denigrate another, but how can you really have an honest and intellectual conversation when you have seven people sitting around a table, each person gets about 22.5 seconds to make a point, someone else cuts them off in their 22 seconds, and then they move along and then it's time to go to commercial break. We don't have the opportunity, in my view, to have honest conversations in the media about our politics because we're so polarized and you want to be wearing the right jersey and saying the right thing to promote your party or your ideology rather than have an honest intellectual discussion about the issues themselves. And finally, I put academia in this because as professors, as people who are in the uh, very responsible position of shaping the next generation, their minds, their thoughts, their aspirations, you find the college campuses are supposed to be the beacon of democracy, of free thought, freedom of expression. And what I've found of nearly 10 years is my students tell me it's suffocating, it's deafening, and it's almost all one way. And what way is that? That way is if you don't think a certain way, act a certain way, believe a certain thing, not only do we not want to hear your opinion, but we want to suffocate it as a result because it's not in line with where you should be. Something that all of us in this profession need to do a better job of taking a look of how do we fix that. So finally, at the end of this journey on Pennsylvania Avenue, where do we get to, but naturally, the most magical 18 acres in Washington, D.C., if not the world, the White House. And it's an honor and a privilege to work there and then you look at the current occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and say, does Donald Trump really recognize the importance of his job, not just as a Republican, but as an American citizen, or has he put the political process and turned it on its head? So last week, I published my first radio documentary for the BBC called The Trumped Republicans. You can find that on the BBC World Service, on the World Wide Internet. And I took the look and said, is Donald Trump a Republican or has he truly disrupted the Republican Party? And it was a lot of fun for me because you got the opportunity to talk to a lot of different people. I brought in Anthony Scaramucci and he said, you know, Trump has turned the party on its head and he's hijacked a party. Not only has he taken it over, he's hijacked it. And we had that interesting discussion we went up to New York City and sat down with Sean Hannity, and Hannity said, well, first of all, Ron, why am I talking to the BBC? And I said, well, because this is important, Sean. People around the world want to understand what's going on in America, and you're one of the biggest megaphones to that. And he said that not only has Donald Trump hijacked the party, as Scaramucci has put forth, but he is actually turning Washington 
on its end on its head and brought in a new era, not only just for the Republicans, but for the way that we will govern henceforth, right? So you have the numbers have actually gone up. Donald Trump's uh, Twitter account has now reached itself to 58.5 million people. The notion that the President of the United States is charting diplomatic missions, is charting domestic policy in either 180 or 280 characters, depending on his mood or his inclination, many find frightening, but many also find this to be the new order. And so as I look at social media and I look at the way that Donald Trump has disrupted the way that we've gone about our politics and our political system, and how many members in Washington, D.C., Republicans, Democrats, have taken to social media to get their message out, I go back to the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue and I ask you to take a, a look at this. Where do these members of Congress now communicate with their constituents? Back in the old days when I worked on Capitol Hill, they'd write in a letter, the letter would come in, the staffer would look at it, the member would respond to it. Now, the constituent sends in a note on Twitter or sends in a note on Facebook, and they want immediate satisfaction by close of business that day. It's changed the way that our politicians are actually conducting business. But it's also changing the way, and I think in a bad way, of the orthodoxy used to be the Speaker of the House or the Minority Leader would chart the course of what they were supposed to do, but now they're playing to social media. And I look forward to your questions, and I look forward to having the opportunity to engage with you, because so much of our conversation here today has been about Twitter and the way that Twitter operates. And one of my more interesting projects last year was to engage Jack Dorsey, the founder and CEO of Twitter, about how we can make that platform a more healthy and a more in in uh, innovative uh, opportunity to have a political discussion. Thank you very much. Let's open the floor. Um, since institutions don't matter, I'm going to ask a long question. And, uh, <laughs> seven parts. Um, Professor uh, Fiorina did not mention, I don't think, um, the, the invention of the primary round election as a major reason the parties would have shifted from 1960 onward. I think Professor Caesar uh, did. So all three of you, and Mark as well, um, mention uh, your view on how primaries are a good idea taken too far, des destroying an important uh, institution. And, and to respond to Jim Caesar's point, m maybe a, um, an institution, the parties that can't be uh, revived, we can't be nostalgic, um, but uh, could we be sanguine about <laughs> polarization, uh, moderating, or being sustainable if we don't have some other institution like parties to, to moderate politics and allow some um, control, quality control. Great. Who, who'd like to take that on first? Well, I did um, have oh. presidential primaries as the first item on the one slide about participation, and I think that that was sort of the leading edge of power to the people, of, of returning power to the grassroots, which obviously hasn't worked that way. But you recall the, um, the, the background of that was Hubert Humphrey was the Democratic nominee in 1968 and didn't enter a single primary, as I recall. This mm -hmm. was the party elites, sure. the party organizations choosing him. And of course, a lot of the energy in the Democratic Party was anti-Vietnam. And so we ended up with, um, with uh, more participatory reforms and Republicans follow suit. But yeah, I think the, the whole, the, the primaries, and, and there's some academic research the early research said there's no difference between closed primaries and open primaries, and the later research says, oh, no, because the only thing is whether it's a primary or no primary, that because even in open primaries, the only people who come are the wingnuts, uh, mm -hmm. and so it doesn't matter whether it's closed or not closed. So, and, and I think that definitely has created this, this R of, um, I mean, we're talking in House primaries, I think their average turnout is about 8%. So in the Democratic primaries, you're going to have the government workers, you're going to have the environmental groups, and Republican primaries, you're going to have the taxpayer groups, the gun groups, and so forth. And so these people, and, and basically in Oregon, Republican faces the same primary electorate now as an Ohio Republican, and New Mexico Democrats, same as a New Jersey Democrat, and that's contributed to the homogenization of the parties. 
You know, Paul, I, I look at this in a slightly different way, that I think the primaries are now being used as a weapon. Uh, on one hand, you have about 40, groups, uh, 40 members of a group called the Freedom Caucus in the House of Representatives, and if they perceive that you don't vote the right way or aren't sufficiently conservative, they could try to find a candidate to take you out in the primary. AOC has been in Congress for about 15 minutes, and she's already encouraging members to be taken out in her own state who aren't progressive enough. And so I, I look at this as a weapon uh, in, a, of a, in a form that we haven't seen before. And I wonder um, in elections moving forward whether or not we can actually field the best candidates as opposed to the best candidates who meet what I believe from an ideological perspective should be done. Well, <clears throat> briefly, what, what, uh, what is there besides the primary? It would be to return, let's say, nominations to conventions of the, the political party and the party activists. But the question that has to be asked, what's the character of the activists uh, today? It's not like the uh, professionals who m m spoke of uh, in Chicago who, who wanted to be able to control members through um, material incentives, sort of prudent or practical sorts of guys. The activists uh, in the party now are um, what James Q. Wilson called amateurs, namely people who are um, extremely devoted to an ideological point of view. So in some ways, the, par the primaries are more moderate, uh, uh, ideally more moderate than the, than the conventions. Those are your only two choices today. There's no going back to what we think of, or many think of, of the parties of, of yesteryear. They, they don't exist and they can't exist. They, they're no longer the fabric of what brings people into the, the political arena. Those who are in it, uh, brought into the, the fabric of, uh, of political parties are far more the activists. Th that's the only choice we have. As for the, the question of what we would get in the future, uh, we're going to have to fi find out. Uh, um, uh, you know, it's not the best of situations, but um, um, who knows? Maybe it'll work out. Maybe it won't be as bad as one could imagine. In any case, uh, I don't see any alternative to, to allowing that situation to come into being, and, and uh, we, we don't have any choice to do otherwise. Just, just to hammer home that point, if you look at the party platforms in 2012 and 2016, the ones adopted at the national conventions, the Republican platform on abortion says never, no exceptions. The Democratic platform says always for any reason. 80% of the American public is in between those two poles. So returning it to the conventions is not going to make things any better. Professor Stoner. Uh, particularly to Jim Caesar, but then to the others. Uh, you spoke, Jim, about uh, Donald Trump coming in and disrupting the party in a way, taking over from outside. I think uh, that was uh, also something that uh, Mr. Christie mentioned. Uh, how different is that from Ronald Reagan's uh, seizure of the Republican Party, so to speak, in 1980? I mean, they're different characters, popular culture you know, from the old movies and popular culture from reality TV. but. Uh, but, uh, but how different in terms of the relation with the party? There were certainly the party regulars were not, Reagan was not their choice. And there were, if not a full candidate like Goldwater, someone like Pat Buchanan who uh, uh, preceded uh, Trump and, and was similar in some policies. Uh, and the second thing that relates to this, I think, and that I don't think anyone has talked about in relation to polarization, has been the use of the independent counsels or special uh, prosecutors, right? This emerged a few times, obviously, in the 70s and the 80s, and then we all agreed it was a bad idea, and it came back. And it's been on top of this presidency from almost the beginning. And I wonder if that hasn't contributed in a way to uh, the special polarization of the moment. Uh, well, Jim first, but you two feel free. <clears throat> well, uh, Pat Buchanan made his way uh, by uh, accessing the primaries. Uh, I, I won't say that par parties in the past were incapable of offering uh, challenges from within. Th after all, the political parties, people are still people, and you had people move in from the outside like William Jennings Bryan and, and take over a party. So parties are Janus-faced institutions, um, sometimes operating to restrain uh, and control the ambitions of uh, people running for the presidency, but often they, they reflect the, the moods and passions of people at the time. Um, and, and so you, you can have takeovers. I would say in 1980, Reagan's position had been prepared for an awful long time right. and uh, within the party, and there were a heck of a lot of people within the party that regarded him as a Republican. Maybe it wasn't a majority, I, I don't know, but an awful lot. 
the, the case with uh, Trump is, is sui generis in this respect. I, I think many people didn't even think he was a Republican uh, at, at the beginning of the process. M maybe they think so today too, but uh, uh, th they didn't think he was a Republican. And he simply came over, uh, took over. Uh, he had no support within the party throughout uh, the whole first part of the nominating season. I think he had one person who's now um, former attorney general. <laughs> that was it, who came closest. And uh, no, no one else. Uh, and you know, you ask the question, why did he have so many uh, strange people in his campaign uh, for which he's uh, pay paying a price? Um, uh, they're, they're all indicted in some way or another. Part of the reason is he has no one else to go to. Uh, there were no Republicans supporting him until Till, till uh, later on. So I think that's the world we're, we're moving into where you don't need to. That's not to say that a lot of people in the future won't have support of a lot of the party members. Some will, some won't. And you look at the, the range of people who are uh, running today, it's the same thing. The Democrats have their chief candidate today is one who's not a Democrat. He's a socialist and uh, not even a member of the Democratic Party, didn't run as a Democratic Party. No one even bothers mentioning that anymore. It's perfectly fine. And we may see others who come in or out uh, in, into the party. But as I said, uh, it seems to be quite possible, uh, Mo, Mo uh, lauded this possibility, it's quite possible that under uh, other sets of circumstances, you'll have someone run who's uh, uh, outside of parties altogether and it won't make a difference four or eight years hence. I, I would look at this, uh, the difference between 1980 and the difference between 2016 is that to quote one Anthony Scaramucci, they hate Donald Trump's guts in the establishment. And Donald Trump was very personal about it. Little Marco, low energy Jeb. I mean, he not only took over a party, but he insulted all the major establishment figures on his quest to the White House, and they take it and still take it very personally. Um, the second part of your question, the independent counsel statute has lapsed and that dealt with, you know, that brought us Ken Starr and that got us the notion of Congress wanting an independent counsel to look at conduct in the executive branch. But with the special counsel, I think your point is exactly right. Nearly two years on uh, from an appointment from the acting attorney general, the deputy attorney general at the time, it's very fascinating that this has been a cloud that has been polarizing Washington, D.C. ever since it was impaneled. Mo, did you want to chime in? No. no? Okay, uh, yes. Yeah, so my question is actually for Mo, so you'll get to chime in on this one. Um, <laughs> so uh, I really like the, the, the thing you pointed out about how most Americans are not, are, are like normal and they're not this sort of 25% or so that's the donor class and the activist class and strong partisans and whatever. But it does seem, uh, from, wh from what I can tell, and I cited some of this a little bit in my, in my own talk yesterday, that, that the percentage of the population that is this sort of um, more extreme strange population or whatever is growing. It's been growing more in recent years. Like there's more Americans who are ideologues than, than there have been maybe a, in the past. Um, not by a, like a, an extreme amount, but it does seem to be growing and it seems to be growing roughly along with the like increase of franchisement and education and stuff like this, like with more people getting degrees. Um, anyway, so I was just wondering, um, do, you, do you share the opinion that it might be growing and if it is growing, if, uh, like, uh, what are the implications of that? N not really. I mean, it's not, I mean, they're, part of it, w we've always thrown in the people who don't have an opinion into the center. And one of the things that's happening in, um, in surveys is there are fewer people with no opinions because there are fewer people answering the surveys. And it tends to be the people who don't have any opinions. And so if you actually look at the people who actually pick a centrist position, the, the distributions of the lines are just flat for the last 40 years. What has occurred, and it's important, is there's an increase in consistency. If you were to the left of center on abortion in, say, 1980, uh, the conditional probability you're also in the left of, left of center on taxes or something is lower than, than it was today. The people have sort of tended to be more systematically left or right, although not necessarily more extreme. Mm. And so that tends to make their voting more, more clear. If you're, if you're voting Democrat in this election, you're probably gonna vote Democratic down the line just because your positions are more consistent. And that I think is probably a reflection of the fact that the parties are sorted and so they've, they've sort of taught people what's, what should go together. And if you don't really think of what should go together, then you become an independent. But if you can sort of live with it, then you stay a Democrat or Republican. But uh, just on numbers, the American National Election Studies, uh, which have been done since 1952, show that consistently, consistently something under 
five percent, generally two or three percent of people say they did something in the campaign. They actually worked in the campaign. Mm -hmm. Two or three people out of every, in any campaign. I mean, president down to dog catcher. And the proportion of donors is always about 10 or 12, and it hasn't increased over time, which is in, sort of inconsistent with the, all of the emphasis on small donors. And it mm -hmm. appears to be the case from some work that it's just the same people over and over again. And you can do it on the internet. So instead of writing $100 check 30 years ago, you now give $10, $10, $10, $10. That, that the, the political class in terms of work and money is somewhere maxed out at say 15% of the population, the eligible electorate. Just one second. I just want to see if anybody else wants to chime in. Thank you. So we all know about President Trump and the wall he wants to build along the Mexican border. And I think it's fair to say that uh, the vast majority of African Americans vote Democrat. So is there a racial element to this polarization partisanship uh, thing that we're talking about? Great. I, I certainly think I think there is, uh, but but I take a different tack to that. Um, when I first arrived on Capitol Hill in 1991, uh, I was summoned to Congresswoman Maxine Waters' office, uh, and I'm being a native Californian, I thought that's great, uh, a California congressman wants to talk to me. And she asked me, she said, are you confused? And I said, uh, no. And she said, you're a Republican. And I said, yes, I am. And she said, well, you're a sellout to your race and you're an Uncle Tom. Ooh. And yeah, you know, I love the libel stuff because my publisher was like, are you sure she said that? I'm like, yeah, I'm sure she said that. <laughs> but there is a racial component to this, that there are a lot of people in the Congressional Black Caucus that are supposed to be the consciousness of the Congress who go after conservative people of color for not adhering to the 90% of folks vote for Democrats, and so you're off the reservation and, and you should be back in the plantation. There's such a large number, <coughs> portion of the American people who don't support either major party uh, and probably no hope of any constitutional amendment to change the nature of the Senate or anything like that anytime soon. I was wondering what you thought of the possibility of moving either towards proportional. I don't think we could do that without a constitutional amendment, but we could increase the number of members of the House of Representatives, which hasn't been done since about 1910. What would you think of increasing that to about 1,200 districts uh, in order to give some impetus to maybe third parties, independents and so on, so that each party would have the incentive to cooperate across party lines then? I don't, uh, I don't know how reforms like that would work. I mean, when you, when you really, it's true, we have very, very large congressional districts compared to other legislatures in the world. Um, I mean, trying to think of uh, all the ways it would affect party organizations and everything, I think is just, uh, it's hard. And I, I don't spend much time on it because I think the chances of doing any of these things are pretty much nil. That uh, we're stuck with the institutional structure we have, barring some just major catastrophe. And so I, when people talk about changing the Senate and everything, I say, well, it's, it's a good classroom exercise, but I'm not gonna waste any energy on it. Anybody else? Well, let, me, let me say something briefly. Okay. So look at the number of bills. In, in the last session that President Obama was in Congress, there were over 10,000 pieces of legislation introduced in the House of Representatives. How many did he end up signing? About 320. So the question is not so much do we need more members of Congress to get different voices to the table. I think there are a lot of divergent views and viewpoints in Congress. The question is how can we get more legislation to be debated and considered in the Congress to make sure that people's voices are heard. Great. So I'm contradicting myself. One more question. All right. Uh, I'll keep it brief. Um, so given the fact that the democratic process is increasingly getting more democratic in the mass sense of it, it seems to me that it's the increasing issue is of a quality matter with regards to civic engagement. The binarization of politics is a big part of the underlying. So I want to ask if any of you might have any ideas as to how we might be able to improve the quality of civic engagement within society to help make people more cognizant and educated in their voting so that we can prevent the the further binarization and forcing of categories onto the parties and thereby having a perhaps more representative and mixed Congress. No, I don't have any comments. Tough question. Well, um, 
Well, one of the problems today is, uh, as I see it, is that um, when people think of uh, what good government is, they approach it in the terms of what makes it more popular democratic, as if that's the same thing as good government. Whereas, you go back to the original thing, even uh, was discussed today, James Madison, he, he begins the, the issue that um, uh, complete control by democratic majorities isn't uh, necessarily gonna produce the, the best results. We have to think of other ways uh, to handle the situation. So uh, th 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 that's the difference, is that um, when we look at uh, our po polity today, we keep asking the questions, what will make it more democratic? And we assume that what will make it more democratic will always make it better. And that's a dilemma, I think, which, uh, w w which uh, we face today, the equalization of those two things. It's not always the case that that's true. Ron? You know, I, I think American history and civics needs to be promoted at a much earlier age of where you make it fun for students to learn and give them the opportunity at a younger age to have that as a part of their curriculum. Um, but it, I, I think if you wait until they're in high school or in college, it's an opportunity missed and, and hopefully uh, something that our educators around the country will take a stronger look at of promoting uh, American history and civics as part of a, a expanded curricula. Great. Mo? No, thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think the panel was wonderful.